Welcome in Brussels. Welcome at already the fourth edition of the EU and International Affairs Conference. And uh, we had a first edition in 2008, I believe. If I would have opened it at that moment, I probably would have said something as, please turn off your mobiles. But the times are changing dramatically, so now I have to tell you, turn on your mobiles so that you can tweet, because indeed for the first time we have a hashtag EU uh, a, a or something like that, 14, you will find it in, in the program. So you can tweet <coughs> to your mother-in-law that you are giving a paper later this morning, uh, this afternoon, and then you will get an answer. I know I'm in the audience by somebody else or something. So, great. Anyway, thank you very much for being here. First of all, first thing I have to do, because this is a conference which is the endeavor of a group of people with some supporters, with people who have been financially and with human resources supporting us. So the first, the very first thing that I have to do is thank uh, our funders, which is Brussels Capital Region, the Jean Monnet Programme of the European Commission, the Fonds de la Recherche Scientifique uh, of Belgium, Fonds Wetenschappelijk Onderzoek Vlaanderen, also Belgium, and the Koninklijke Vlaamse Academie for Belgium for Wetenschappen and Kunsten, which is the place where we are. As you know, this is a conference <coughs> co-organized <coughs> by four institutes which is the Institute for European Studies of the Vrije Universiteit Brussel, the Institut d'Etudes Européens, Université Libre de Brussel, we're missing somebody from ULB at the moment, Egmond, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, and the United Nations University Institute on Comparative Regional Integration Studies, also known as UCRIS. We share the responsibility for organizing this, but I think my colleagues from VUB, ULB and Egmond will agree with me that in preparing this conference there has been one institute, as always, or in the past editions as well, who has taken the lead on making all the preparations, and that is the Institute for European Studies of the VUB. So I will thank my colleagues for all the work done. Without further ado, it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce our keynote speaker for today, which is David Malone. David Malone is a Canadian author on many aspects of international security and development. He is also, he was also a career diplomat, former president of the uh, International Peace Institute, uh, president of the International Development Research Center in Canada, and uh, in, since March 2013, uh, he became, amongst other things, my boss. I know, you can have some sympathy with him. Uh, as he took up the position of UN Under Secretary General and became rector of the United Nations University. He has published widely on, on very different uh, topics. Uh, I have some quotes here, some titles, The Law and Practice of the UN in Oxford University Press 2008, The International Struggle over Iraq, The UN Security Council from Cold War to the 21st Century, etc., etc. Today, he will speak about UN and EU relations in the context of international relations, and I would like you to clap hands and very warmly welcome David Malone. David, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Luke, and to the uh, conference organizers. I had the pleasure of sitting in uh, uh, on part of an excellent panel on the Eurasian uh, region. I learned a lot from it. The panelists were interesting. The questions were great. It was very exciting. It's very exciting being at a conference full of younger colleagues. Uh, it isn't always the way. And so I think one of the great strengths of this conference is the age distribution. And uh, I wish more conferences were able to achieve such a happy outcome. Um, it also uh, contains a tremendous amount of expertise, clearly, judging from the panel I just attended. I'm delighted that it gives UNU an opportunity to be known through our own researchers in Bruges and perhaps from elsewhere. I won't bang on about UNU as a result because you have many of my colleagues here who can tell you if you're interested uh, more about it. Uh, I'll go straight into my subject. I'm going to talk about the UN. I'm going to talk about the EU. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about how outsiders might view the EU at the moment. 
particularly how it might be viewed in Asia. Um, and I'll try to speak for only 20 minutes so that my provocations can be responded to by uh, any of you who feel like uh, doing so. Obviously, I'm speaking in a personal capacity. I'm not speaking for anybody else. Starting with the UN, uh, as you know, at the moment, uh, it organizes itself intellectually under uh, a structure of three pillars of substantive pursuit. The first is peace and security. And on peace and security, with the end of the Cold War, uh, there was an explosion in the UN's activity because the permanent five members found they could work with each other and agree with each other on many things, even though they might disagree on some other things. And through ups and downs over the ensuing 20 years, this remained true. The Security Council agrees on about 95% of its agenda. And at any given time, you might have two or three contentious files that uh, are dealt with in a way by quarantining them relative to the more consensual agenda, which often centers on security crises in Africa. And the security crises in Africa at the moment are being dealt with fairly consensually uh, in the Security Council, with European Union countries, notably France, playing a very important role in several, in trying to contain several of those crises, Mali, Central African Republic, and some other EU um, partners uh, joining in, the Netherlands notably in Mali. The French desperately need more company in the Central African Republic, and uh, they are entitled, I think, to look around them in Europe and see who might be willing to uh, help them there uh, because they're doing uh, very important work. Uh, so the first pillar of the UN uh, really, by and large, uh, was quite successful until some events starting three years ago with the Libya crisis, during which Western powers sought a mandate from the Security Council to intervene military, uh, militarily in Libya, received the mandate they asked for, which was quite a narrow one, having to do with the protection of civilians. But somehow NATO got carried away with itself, and next thing we knew it was involved in the death of Gaddafi, which was nowhere in the mandate, and which really uh, gave rise to a tremendous amount of concern on the part of Russia, China, India, Brazil, countries that actually matter in the world, but which Western capitals tend to forget actually matter in the wider world. So uh, this uh, set the stage for suspicion on Syria, an inability to agree on all but uh, rather unambitious objectives in uh, Syria. Uh, the continued arming of the combatants by various member <coughs> states of the UN, uh, and as we all know, a very, very bad result in Syria, apart from, as I say, uh, a relatively small success on chemical weapons and uh, very serious efforts to provide humanitarian assistance, but with very mixed results. In turn, uh, Crimea is now grafted on top of the tensions over Syria. So the climate in the Security Council really is not good and could eventually infect the consensus that is uh, often created on African issues and if issues in other parts of the world. So I can't say I find the Security Council today in robust uh, health in terms of the relations amongst the permanent members uh, and its capacity to face new challenges. I'm much more optimistic about the second pillar, which we tend to forget about, which is human rights. When the Cold War ended, uh, the UN had been able to do a tremendous amount of normative development through treaty making 
during the 60s and 70s, producing a number of important treaties, uh, building on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but the capacity of the UN to act in relation to these treaties was rather limited. Perez de Cuellar and Boutros Ghali took advantage of the end of the Cold War to take the initiative to create a High Commissioner for Human Rights. The first High Commissioner was very diplomatic and he did us all the favor of getting the job started. But the three subsequent uh, High Commissioners have not been diplomatic at all. They have defended human rights. All three are very strong women uh, and uh, they have done an exceptional job. And they have forced human rights onto the center stage at the UN where many member states would actually be more comfortable seeing them quarantined in Geneva in uh, debates nobody follows. So human rights actually much more present, linked today to international criminal justice, which is another innovation of the last 20 years. And so uh, a real change, and for me, a positive one at the United Nations. A uh, third pillar uh, development in which the UN again has played a very important normative role but in which it was never the lead actor in terms of provision of development assistance. That was always the World Bank, the regional development banks, more business-like places than uh, the UN. But normatively the UN through things like the Millennium Development Goals, uh, uh, and other programs through several of its excellent agencies uh, has played an important role. Now both the peace and security activities of the UN and the development activities of the UN are being, uh, beginning to be very seriously affected by the fallout of the financial crisis slow moving since 2008. The governments who have been funding all of this are short of money themselves. If you look at who funds the UN, European Union member states fund a large chunk of it, the United States, Japan, a few others, what they have in common is they've all been in crisis and money is short. And that shortness of money when you're a politician becomes critical. You think first and foremost of your domestic constituents. You would like to be a responsible actor internationally, but more important are your domestic constituents. So this uh, creates knock-on effects, uh, one of them being that uh, key member states of the UN have told the Secretariat of the UN that, well, peace and security is important, but by the way, we're establishing a ceiling of $8 billion on peacekeeping activity. So you manage below the ceiling, but that's the ceiling. And that's brand new, so that's a real development. Uh, and in the development um, cooperation field, uh, member states, European ones, other ones, have never been entirely truthful about their development programs. A great deal of the money in many cases is spent at home. A lot of it is spent promoting commercial interests. Uh, but there was always a core of it that was spent on genuine development activities. And uh, that uh, core is shrinking very fast in the donor countries. And this produces knock-on effects for the UN and other actors in the development field. So uh, for those who think that the crisis is over, actually, no, the knock-on effects of the crisis are just beginning for actors like the UN and their clients. European Union. I should say I'm a great fan and I've always as a Canadian thought the European Union was a fabulous project, a great model for the rest of the world, uh, a fast moving adventure that was rather kinetic. There was always something new being done, usually something that was a good idea that perhaps could be replicated somewhere else. Uh, but the EU is also affected very much by the financial crisis, although the politicians 
don't speak in those terms about it. And uh, citizens around the EU are concerned that they are subject to taxation and uh, regulation, not only at the national level, often at the regional and local level, but also by a hyperactive commission that keeps issuing more regulations about more things, and basta in many places. And the EU, the new team at the EU, needs to think this through, rationalize, do fewer things, and do them better, probably. And meanwhile, it will be dealing with a very different, probably, European uh, partner. The European Union has been an excellent partner for the UN, particularly in the humanitarian field. Uh, we tend to forget what a huge actor the EU is in the humanitarian field, and the UN's rather impressive humanitarian activities and agencies like the World Food Program, UNICEF, the High Commissioner for Refugees, and also the non-UN International Committee of the Red Cross and its very impressive activities would be nowhere much without the EU. So it's an invisible, in many ways, function of the EU that has been tremendously important and positive at the international uh, level. Uh, and I'd like to pay tribute uh, to it. Um, but uh, I'd have to say, coming to Asia, uh, and how Asians might look at the UN. About three years ago, I published a book on Indian foreign policy, which uh, I had a lot of fun researching, and 90% of my sources were Indian. And uh, I lumped Europe, Western Europe, together with the Russian Federation in a chapter on declining relationships, not expanding relationships. And why is this? Well, India is a busy place. It's a continent-sized country. It has four times the population of Europe, and it's hard to impress, mainly because it's very concerned with itself. It has very strong and meaningful relationships bilaterally with France, Britain, Germany, to some extent Italy. It has niche relationships it values with the Netherlands and Spain, some others. But overall, the European Union is a puzzle to the Indians. And why is it a puzzle to the Indians? Well, they keep getting visits from the governments of the European Union, and then there's a whole raft of people with European titles which are incomprehensible in the world outside Europe who also want to come and visit and take up the very limited bandwidth in India for foreign visitors with um, presumably serious agendas. So uh, the European Union has not been contagious in Asia at all, and outside the sphere of trade in which the European Commission has a clear and undisputed mandate, although often manipulated by powerful member states, uh, it has to be said that the European Union has not been able to establish a strong identity or partnership in Asia. Why does this matter? We are stagnating in the West. Asia is rising very quickly. Now, it's rising from a low starting point, and the rise will be uneven and may even be interrupted at times. But they have momentum, and we don't. So what they think of us, we need to internalize and wonder about. That's why I mention it today, uh, because I had not expected to be including Europe in India's declining relationships rather than uh, relationships that uh, it thought of as seriously. As I say, it takes France, Germany, and Britain very seriously, and uh, the European project is a distant one. Uh, for them, and one they aren't particularly uh, attracted to. So, um, where does this uh, leave us? It leaves us with an important motor in international relations, Europe, still in crisis. You know, we're always, we're always criticizing the Americans. We Canadians, it's a national sport. 
We criticize the Americans nonstop. But actually, when the Americans started this crisis, because they were the ones who started it, if you look back, they were extraordinarily energetic at addressing the crisis at its outset. When you look at what Bush and Paulson did at the outset of the crisis, running completely against the Republican Party's ideology, followed on by what Obama, Geithner, and a few others did in Washington, pretty impressive. Hardly surprising that they are beginning to emerge from the crisis, that most of the banks have paid back what they owe, that General Motors has paid back largely what it owes, and so on. Um, in Europe, frankly, the story is much less positive in the sense that the worst may be over, but there are clearly a number of icebergs still out there that have not been addressed head on yet by uh, European member states or the European uh, institutions. I only mention that because that's a problem for the world, because Europe has been such a positive actor in uh, world affairs, a funder of a great deal that matters, uh, and a contributor of ideas, often very attractive ideas, uh, and it's very self-involved at the moment in a way that hasn't been sufficiently productive in overcoming the crisis. Obviously, this is a personal view, but it's won by an observer of Europe sitting in Tokyo, a fan of Europe, uh, and I wish I could give a more encouraging report at this point, but as many of you are European, I think it bears uh, perhaps considering why the Asians may not be overwhelmed by uh, the five recent years that Europe has both endured and engineered for itself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, as said, indeed, this is, uh, we have some time for questions and answers or comments. So please, if you want to ask a question or raise a comment, raise your hand. And there are some mics available. Do I see anybody? Yes, in the back over there. Uh. I'm Stefan Keukler from the University of Leuven and College of Europe. You indicated that the Asian countries still take United Kingdom, Germany and France serious, but you also see a decline in their in the perception about these countries, or is it remaining on the same level? I think, you know, um, uh, first of all, Britain and France play a particular role in the UN, which many Asians may think is unjustified, but is recognized, and it's also recognized that Britain and France are contributors of ideas in the Security Council and that they have also contributed to rescuing the UN when it's in trouble, as has done the wider European Union through uh, Operation Artemis and a few years later the intervention in Kivu. They were band-aid short-term solutions, but they were important and uh, valuable. Um, so I think those countries are on the map because of their permanent seats and because they also, knowing that they are declining relative to other world powers, try to contribute and make an argument for themselves by contributing. And France really is doing a lot of that in Africa at the moment with, as I say, insufficient European company in my view. And I wish my own country, Canada, would do more to keep France company uh, in Africa. Um, now, coming to Germany, it's recognized as a major economic actor. Um, it's taken very seriously by China, by Japan, by everybody in Asia as a very serious uh, economic actor. And in fact, it's seen as the European leader. Britain and France are not seen as the European leader. Germany is. And its quiet approach is all the more effective, in a way, in it being seen um, as uh, a leader. But the rest uh, 
is pretty well out of focus except for niche markets. Uh, Europe is considered a very high-tech part of the world. Uh, it's considered a great purveyor of luxury products in Asia, and Asians love luxury products when they can afford them. It's a great place to have holidays, but frankly, beyond that, uh, it's a bit vague what uh, Europe is. I was talking actually about India. I didn't want to uh, um, suggest that I know what the Chinese think about Europe. I really don't know that. Uh, occasionally I hear the Chinese in a worldview. I can speak with some confidence on India only because I researched it. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, uh, you were talking about Can you the please introduce yourself? Okay. Jean Christophe de Fregne. I'm a professor at the Institute for European Studies of University of Saint Louis in Brussels. Uh, I was a bit wondering because you seem to find the French role in Africa quite positive, but on the other hand, you have expressed some regrets or I would say some limitations about the intervention in Libya, which was the mandate was not seen as being particularly respected by Russia and China. But if we look at the French policy in Africa, it has used much more hard power very recently, sending military troops not only in Libya and Mali, but also in Ivory Coast, for example. It is involved in Central Africa. In the case of Libya, if you look at the Chinese reaction, China had to repatriate uh, 32,000 Chinese workers. The Chinese foreign ministry talked about a loss of 19 billions of dollars due to the French, uh, UK, and NATO intervention in Libya, which has created a lot of nationalist reaction in China against the French and British intervention in Libya. No, there are also Chinese officials who are wondering whether the hosting of Laurent Gbagbo in Ivory Coast and its support by the French army to Ouattara was not also because Gbagbo was offering a lot of economic contract tied with economic aid programs from China. So in that sense, is the role of friends in Africa not creating, I would say, nationalist reactions from China or fear that from China that the EU is backing some hard power in Africa? Uh, in brief, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. In the, in the front here, and then over there. I'm going to switch the subject a little bit. Hi, I'm Deepa Acharya, and um, I'm a researcher at the Institute for European Studies here in Brussels. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky me. I'm American, so I won't, uh, if you're crisis, things are spot on, which your comments are. But um, I work on India, and um, actually, contrary to what you were saying, you've just done research on India. I, in fact, think you were one of the people who could really speak with authority on this issue, considering your book and your previous experience in India. Um, it was refreshing to hear your opinions about kind of the way, and I think this was a really astute um, observation about the way that there's this kind of multiple participation of different member states, and it confuses the Indian government about what the role is. I was curious, though, you said EU is a puzzle to the Indians. I'm curious that considering what happened on Friday with the elections and kind of the new government in place that's kind of repositioned India's goals in, in context of foreign policy, uh, what your opinions would be in terms of with this new kind of government in place, how would the EU even go about um, putting together um, a foreign policy towards India and what kind of issues should be covered? Great. Well, um, Thank you for your comments. Uh, the first thing to be said about the new government is we just don't know. For India, there are three relationships that matter critically. China, the United States, and Pakistan. And that's perfectly normal. The Euro European Union shouldn't be upset that it's not one of those key relationships. And I won't go into why, but I think you can all guess why those three relationships are important. Uh, uh, to India. Now, uh, the EU and India have been trying to negotiate a free trade agreement in 
goes back so far, I can't even remember when it started. It's gotten absolutely nowhere. Uh, probably uh, the Indian negotiators were more at fault than the European ones because their negotiating style is, by and large, not to agree. Because in India, you're never blamed for stalling, but you are blamed for selling out to foreigners. Uh, very easily. So the incentives of Indian negotiators to be hyper prudent, not to say inert, is uh, very strong. Modi may change that because his program revolves around economic growth. And to achieve economic growth, India needs more outside investment. It needs to become more of an international trader. And we all know it can. So which instruments Modi and his team choose to uh, try to implement this overriding goal of reintroducing high growth to India, we don't yet know. We don't yet know who his key team will be, although we know some of the members of his new team, but we don't know what the actual policies are going to be. If the trade negotiators change, uh, I'll know that there's something serious happening on uh, uh, the trade negotiations with the European Union, Canada, many others, and they've all been stalled for a very long time. The main achievement has been a very partial free trade agreement with ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian uh, Nation Countries. Uh, but I think uh, the new government of India provides an opportunity for a new beginning. Uh, I think the relations of India can be more positive with each of China, the US, and Pakistan. And a strong government is always more likely to produce significant and positive change than very weak governments. And unfortunately, in the last five years in India, we had a government which, for a variety of reasons, was, as you know, uh, quite weak. Thank you very much. We can take one more question, lady over there. Uh, yeah, thank you. Christina Eckes from the Amsterdam Center for European Law and Governance at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, my research focus is not specifically in Asia, so please forgive me if my question is more an interesting observer. You spoke a lot about trade and economic uh, relations. I was wondering where does energy come in? I mean, with the increasing demand of Asian countries in energy, it seems maybe that Russia and the, let's say, European countries you named should not be lumped together in that sense, but that, these relation, that this relationship might actually be fundamentally changing. Well, uh, you raise a very interesting question because uh, I'm participating on the margins of a project about the bilateral relationship between India and Japan. And energy is a huge subject for that project because both countries have a huge need of energy resources. So where are these going to come from? India um, has done very poorly on uh, assuring supply of energy and because the country's uh, air is already very polluted, is unlikely to, unlikely to be able to fully exploit its domestic coal resources. The same is true for China, with uh, unbearable pollution in uh, many of China's areas. So it's a very big uh, issue. At the same time, we're constantly surprised in the energy field. We tend to project into the future on the basis of the present. But actually, shale gas took us all by surprise. The fact that the US should be, again, a major producer and likely exporter is hot news in Canada, which imagined it was going to be exporting mainly to the United States over the next 50 years change of plan, and we need a new policy in Canada. Uh, so things change quite fast on the environmental, uh, on the energy front, and that is related, as I say, in Asian minds, increasingly to past policies that have been environmentally unsustainable, as air quality deteriorates sharply, not just in China, the air quality in India in uh, some urban centers like Delhi is even worse on recent statistics. So these governments really need to think hard. 
I'm sure Russia will be a supplier for countries like Japan, continue to be a supplier for China uh, and others, but likely new sources of energy will take us all by surprise in years to come. There's a huge amount of research going into uh, sources, unconventional sources of energy, uh, and we are bound to be surprised by the outcomes of some of this. So uh, you're right to identify it as a huge issue. You're right to identify Russia as a major actor, but Canada thought of itself as a major actor and now finds itself as a major actor somewhat in need of clients. <laughs> Good, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, unfortunately, the, the time is, is uh, moving on, so we have to end this session. Uh, not again without thanking David for being with us and for sharing with us his quite stimulating ideas, and I'm sure they will influence the rest of the debates in, in the coming days here. I understand that you will join us for lunch now, so if you have any other comments or pressing questions, uh, I'm sure you can address them over lunch to, to David. We will resume at a 2 o'clock sharp for the next round of parallel sessions. The lunch will be served upstairs, so that is about all I say. So once again, thank you very much, David. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you.